Good afternoon, everybody. I can see some friendly faces on the screen. Um, my name is Angelo Beveridge, and I work as a curator at the uh, Hunterian, um, dealing with the art collection with my colleagues. And today, I'm going to talk to you about Winifred and Margaret Davidson's recent bequests and gifts. <clears throat> They came over to the Hunterian over the last um, decade or so, um, and um, I will be focusing on the 40 or so paintings and drawings by Scottish artists associated with the Glasgow style that they bequeathed in between 2011 and 2014. Now, the name Davidson might ring a bell with those among you who are familiar with the history of Macintosh and the MacDonald collection at the Hunterian. Winfred and Margaret's grandparents, William and Jean, were early patrons and friends of the Macintoshes, commissioning the architect to design a new home for their family, Windy Hill House in Carmacombe, outside Glasgow, at the turn of the 20th century, <clears throat> and purchasing the couple's Glasgow home in 1920 after the Macintoshes were in unsuccessful in their attempt to sell. The Macintosh's Glasgow home is where Winfred and Margaret's father, Hamish, and their uncle, Cameron, grew up. At the death of their parents in 1945, Hamish and Cameron were instrumental in ensuring the Macintosh Glasgow home and its interiors were partly gifted and partly offered on sale to the university, together with a large amount of material documenting the family's involvement with the Macintoshes over the years. <clears throat> now, transition, of course, it always just does that at the beginning. There we go. Um, without them, the Davidson family, the pioneering, pioneering uh, interiors of the Macintosh's Glasgow home, put together between 1904 and 1914, would probably not have been preserved as they were left by the couple when they moved to England just before the First World War. <clears throat> and thanks to the Davidsons, visitors to the Hunterian Art Gallery can experience in person the reconstitution of these interiors at the Mac House. Details on where to find more information on the Davidson family and their key role in preserving the Macintosh legacies are on your screen. And if you struggle to get them and you want them, I can put them in the chat box at the end. <clears throat> what is lesser known is that William and Jean's granddaughter, Winfred, who was a nurse by profession, and Margaret, who was a teacher at, at King Edward VI High School for Girls, have entrusted the Hunterian with the works of arts that they inherited from their family, as well as more archival material documenting the making of their grandparents' collection. They provide a precious glimpse into the tastes and patronage activities of a couple who were dedicated supporters of contemporary Scottish art in the first few decades of the 20th century. <clears throat> first, I intend to provide context for the group of works left by Margaret and Winfred, sharing what I know about their history when in the Davidson collection. And that's very much a work in progress, I should say. I will then focus on some of my favorites to give you a taste of that remarkable collection. Emphasis will be on the way their gifts have transformed the Hunterian's existing holdings of works by Scottish artists associated with the Glasgow Skull, a style that in the decades around the turn of the 20th century helped to bring attention to Scottish art throughout Europe and North America. The bulk of Margaret and Winfred's paintings and drawings were bequeathed respectively in 2011 and 2014. And these bequests are a testimony to the ongoing relationship between the Davidson family and the university. In this case, with Professor Pamela Robertson, who was curator of the Macintosh collection that the Hunterian from the 1980s until the mid 2010s and met over the years with the two sisters regularly. <clears throat> the two bequests amount to around 60 paintings and works on paper, representing 25 artists in total. Together, they represent roughly two thirds of the collection put together by their grandparents. Overall, the artists who caught the eye of William and Jean were often acquaintances and in some instances, friends. Many were highly regarded ex-students of Glasgow School of Art who had benefited from the support of its director, Francis H. Newberry, who was a leading figure in British art and design in the late 19th and early 20th century. Newberry was also on friendly terms with the Davidsons. The artists they collected the Davidsons, also often tended to be among the Scottish artists held as talent talented exponents of the Glasgow style and of modern Scottish art at home and abroad. In the letter now in our cabin special collection in the University of Glasgow, Cameron, 
Winfred and Margaret's uncle wrote of his father, William, and I quote, as regards individual artists, the two who I think he helped most, in addition to Charles René Mackintosh, were Hornell and Pringle, from both of whom he, pur he purchased several pictures. <clears throat> he also knew many others, and he was a well-known member of the Glasgow Art Club. He was immensely interested in all forms of artistic expressions, architecture, painting, engraving, photography, etc., as well as literature and music, and he collected pictures primarily for the pleasure that they gave him." End of quote. According to evaluation of the collection, which is part of that same archive, written in 1945 at the death of William and Jean Davidson, many of these works were displayed in their home among the Macintosh's interior. I was talking to Rachel just before we started and saying, I, I, I find it really hard to picture those 60 paintings hanging in the Mac house as it stands today. It must, it must have given it a very different feel. Anyway, um, so, in the dining room, for example, we know that there was a portrait of um, William Davidson by William Somerville, Somerville Shanks that you can see on your screen, um, as well as a Macaulay Stevenson landscape, a John Red Murray pastoral, which is possibly in the Hunterian now, uh, a painting by E.A. Hornell, a watercolor by an artist called Mayer, and a flower watercolor by Macintosh, which I suspect is also probably in the Hunterian today. The first work I would like to focus on today is a portrait of William Davidson, which also happens to be the first painting gifted by the two sisters jointly back in 2006. They join, the portrait joined numerous family photographs of William already in the Hunterian collection, and you can see one of them on the right of your screen here. And um, with the photographs that are already in the collection, um, the portrait gives us a glimpse into the personality of William Davinson, who was a Glasgow-based produce broker and commission merchant, who was described by his contemporaries as a cultured, reserved, loyal friend, a talented music musician, you can see him at his piano there, and a keen amateur photographer. The painting was commissioned as a present to their father by Hamish and Cameron in 1929-1930, the year of their father's 60th birthday, so I suspect it is a 60th birthday present. By that time, the Davidsons had been living in the Macintosh's Glasgow home at 78 South Park Avenue since 1920. <clears throat> the subject of some correspondence, the portrait took a while to be completed partly because the sitter was rarely available for sittings. And according to Cameron in a letter thanking the artist for the portrait, partly because he was not always the easiest sitter. I don't quite know what Cameron meant by that, but we can leave it to the imagination. William Davidson and his sons knew Somerville Shanks personally. Like Macintosh, Shanks had taken evening classes at the Glasgow School of Art in the late 1880s. He then went on to Paris to study at the Académie Julian in the early 1890s. I've included on your screen here a still life by Shanks, which is from the Hunterian collection and was executed shortly after the artist returned from his Parisian st studies to give you an idea of his style. A play on the dynamic tonal contrasts of black and whites, its fluid and expressive bravura technique pays homage to the long-standing Pentelli tradition dating back to 17th century masters like Velázquez and Franz Halls that had recently been brought back center stage by contemporary artists like Edouard Manet, for example, that we know Somerville Shanks really admired. Once settled back in Scotland, Shanks was hailed as a talented exponent of the late Glasgow style. By the time he was commissioned to paint the portrait of William Davidson, he was teaching at Glasgow School of Art and lived at 8 Pargrove Terrace in Glasgow, 15 minutes walk or so from the Davidson's Glasgow home in South Park Avenue. He was also by then considered, a, a high, he was highly considered as a portrait painter. Now here you have to excuse my amateur um, attempts at showing you what the painting would have looked like in the Mac house. I've just cut and pasted it above the sideboard that we know he was hanging. Um, we know that the portrait was thought a great success by the family and found its place in the dining room above the sideboard. A striking image, it relies on the powerful use of strong contrast and colors and sophisticated composition with its oriental decorative dish in the background. 
Looking at the portrait within the setting of the Macintosh House dining room, I can't help wondering whether Shanks had this very room in mind when coming up with this composition, as it plays on strong contrast within the limited color range dominated by darker tones that seem to match the sophisticated mood created by Macintosh. It's a very welcome addition to the Hunter and Collections, not just because it captures the likeness of a benefactor, but also because it's a good portrait and it does add to our representation of works by Somerville Shanks and almost doubled it more or less. So um, now it's time to highlight a few more of the, of the recent bequests done in 2011 and 2014. And I will start with Macintosh, uh, who was um, a friend of William and Jean Davidson, um, who were themselves among um, Mac the Macintosh's most dedicated supporters. Um, the Davidsons bought 20 um, watercolors from Margaret MacDonald and Charles René Macintosh, particularly during the difficult later years in London and in France. Um, in 1932, a year after the commemorative exhibition William organized to celebrate the remarkable career of his friend, he donated 12 of those to the Hunterian and the rest went to his children. Eight further works by the two artists have now entered the collection thanks to Winfred and Margaret. Most are highly accomplished works that significantly add to the Hunterian's ability to represent their careers as painters in watercolors. And I've picked two to share with you, starting with Macintosh Begonia, which you can see on your screen. Now, during the years that Macintosh spent in London from 1915 to 1923, Macintosh produced vibrant textile designs and painted a small group of related flower still life compositions. <clears throat> These were his main source of income. The dissolution of his architectural practice at the end of 1913 and the restrictions on new buildings which followed the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 had a very negative impact on his activities on, as an architect and he relied on those to have an income. Davinson bought begonias in 1919 in response to a plea from Macintosh for ma financial support. The letter on your screen stresses how handy the purchase was, enabling the artist to pay his rent. Just like the textile designs the artist was busy working on then, it draws on his lifelong study of plant forms. It is also one of the finest of his London still lives and a most welcome addition to the Hunterian strong collection of works from that period. The next work is the Church of La Lagoine, which is dated uh, from uh, sometime in between 1923 and 1927. La Lagoine is a small hamlet to the north of Mont Louis in the Pyrenean Mountains. The landscape belongs to a series of over 40 celebrated watercolors of the local landscape and architecture of the area in the south of France, which the Macintosh is called home between 1923 and 1927. The artist, who favored, who favored bright windless days, which allowed him to work out of doors and to see his subject crisply defined by light and shadow, delighted in the patterns he found in the outlines of fields and the angles of roof lines, cables and windows. The view to the left of the watercolor is taken from the spot where Macintosh stood 100 or so years ago when painting this watercolor. It highlights how much the spot has changed since not surprising, as the authors of Charles René Macintosh en Roussillon explain in their website dedicated to the artist's work in the south of France. And you have the address on your screen. If you're interested, they've done a really brilliant job of getting images of those places that Macintosh painted in and showing to you what they look like today. If nothing else, it's a great kind of way of spending a rainy, cold December afternoon. Anyway. The watercolor, used to, the watercolor used to hang in the staircase of the Mac House when in the Davidson home and was one of three Roussillon landscapes in their collection, which are now all in the Hunterian. Thanks to the Davidson sisters, the Hunterian now represent Macintosh's French years with 14 watercolors, which is quite a chunk of their output. Moving away from Charles Ray Macintosh, I would like to spend the last few minutes touching on other artists the Davidson family was particularly keen on. As I mentioned earlier, the 26 artists represented in the portion of their collections, nine the Hunterian, often tend to be among the Scottish artists hailed as talented exponent of the Glasgow style and of modern Scottish art, both at home and abroad. 
Thanks to Chui Russell, and I know she's in the audience, curatorial assistant at the Hunterian, who spent some time this week extracting information from receipts for paintings acquired by William Davidson, now kept in the University Archive and Special Collection, I can tell you that works with receipts were mostly purchased between 1918 and 1935 from well-known auction houses of the time, such as GNR Edmondson and Wiley and Lockhead, or picture dealers such as Alex Reed and Thomas and Robert Annan. William Davidson, who was a member of the Glasgow Art Club, also bought at annual exhibitions of his club and at annual exhibitions of the Royal Glasgow Institute of Fine Art. But from 1932, he seems to have almost exclusively bought through the art dealer, Ian McNichol. Perhaps partly because pressure on his time meant that he did not have time anymore to attend auctions, or partly because Ian McNichol seems to have excelled at understanding what his clients were after. And a lot of the Scottish art collection in the Hunterian was purchased through Ian McNichol in the 1930s and 50s and 60s. The first artist I would like to spotlight is John Quinton Pringle, whom you may recall was among the two artists beside Macintosh that, according to his son Cameron, William Davidson supported the most. As a young man, <clears throat> Pringle seems to have been close to Macintosh and to Shanks. They probably met when attending evening classes at Glasgow School of Art in the 1880s and were soon noticed by Davidson and by Newbury, the director of the Glasgow School of Art. And Newbury in particular, in particular held him as among the most talented and original of his pupils. The artist has been described in a recent Sotheby's Action catalogue as, and I quote, an eccentric but highly distinctive artist, much revered in Scotland, who deserves greater recognition and whose work is rare. Only some hundred works survive. It's nice to see this because it's true that outside of Scotland, Pringle is not really that well known and he does deserve to be better known. Before Margaret and Winfrey's gifts, the Hunterian counted four works by the artist in his collection. If we dismiss the impressive 35 works now part of Glasgow Museum's collection, and they were all gifts from James Meldrum, who did for Pringle's legacy what uh, Davidson did for Macintosh's legacy, the Hunterian representation of the artist was already second best and bragging here. It was only matched by the National Galleries of Scotland and Tate Britain. Thanks to the generosity of Margaret and Winfred, it has jumped to 10 works and now offers a more comprehensive overview of the artist's career from the late 1880s to the First World War. Davidson was very fond of Pringle. The archival material donated by or purchased from the family now in the university includes receipts for Monet Trudeau's a memorial for the artist, inaugurated in 1927, exhibition catalogues of Pringle's works, and correspondence with the Meldrum's family. In total, William Davidson's purchased eight works by Pringle and lent five to the 1928 exhibition of the artist's works organized by James Meldrum at Glasgow School of Art. And you can see three of them on your screen here. The other two haven't been photographed yet. So hopefully we'll have photography available in the new year. The presence of girls at play, which is one of um, my favorite painting by um, Pringle, provides me with an opportunity to highlight that several works purchased by William Davidson were later sold by the family or given to other institutions. So there are works from the Davidson collection in um, Glasgow museums, for example. Um, this one, Girls at Play, was purchased by Professor Alec McPhee, another hero of mine who left his entire collection of Scottish art as a Hunterian through a series of gifts and a final bequest in 1980. Figures in a street scene on the right of the screen used to hang in what is called in the um, valuation of the collection at Davidson's death, the brown bedroom. Um, we have no clue what this brown bedroom would have looked like, and it must have been in the upper level of the Mac house. The six works gifted by Margaret and Winfried include the miniature portrait of their uncle, and you have one shown in the middle of your screen, um, as well as two views of Glasgow and one of Largo Bay in Fife. Together, they highlight the support given by William Davidson from the onset of the artist's career when Pringle was setting himself up as an artist whilst offering optical and other repair services as well. Now, on your, on your screen, you can see the earliest of the two landscape, Glasgow cityscapes that come from the Davidson sisters collection. And it's called Old Houses Bridgeton and it's dated from 1890. It belongs to a series of urban views inspired by Pringle's native East End, painted when he was attending classes at Glasgow School of Art alongside Macintosh, Shanks, and Murad Bone, among others. 
representative of the artist's earlier work, it reflects his affinity with the Glasgow boys and their interest in tonal values. Old houses and back courts of his native Glasgow East End were fascinating to Pringle and several watercolors record Bridgeton. This view was taken at the back of old houses in Muslim Street and records with minute details, textures and features such as the fences, red brick walls or wooden outbuildings. This contrast with the foreground, a rough backyard area inhabited by two figures where vegetation and the earth beaten grounds are suggested with layers upon layers of brush strokes in earthy tonal colors enlivened by dabs of pure color. And I, unfortunately, the picture I have um, is not really allowing you to see as a detail in the background, but it is truly beautiful. Um, the picture that we have is so high in resolution, I didn't manage to bring it down to a format that would allow me to put it in the PowerPoint presentation, which was frustrating. So I would invite you to come and have a look at it in person in the Hunterian. When hung in the Macintosh house, it was in the entrance hall. I will move on to the Glasgow boys now, um, because whilst works by the Macintosh and Pringle count for roughly half of Davidson's granddaughter's gift and bequest, the other half is dominated by the Glasgow boys and girls. The group, a group of influential artists working in Glasgow in the late 19th century, the Glasgow boys and girls had in common with other European and American avant-garde artists, <clears throat> a consuming interest in the mastering of light and color. At first, exploring the real, real realism and naturalism as developed by French and Dutch artists, by the late 1880s, the Glasgow boys were moving towards a more decorative approach, weaving their colors and brushwork in a manner almost flirting with the abstract effects at time. Just like Pringle, Macintosh, and Shanks, they too were seen as pioneering artists by their contemporaries. And I'll, I'll just... Um, move on to the two pictures that I want to concentrate on, um, just so that if you're not familiar with our work, you, you can see what it looks like. Now, in his introduction to David Martin's book, The Glasgow School of Painting, which was published in 1897, Francis H. Newberry stated, and I quote, they have a firm belief in one thing, which is that it is quite sufficient for art to be art and to be the most beautiful thing that the hand of man is capable of making of her, end of quote. A statement I think Davidson would have wholeheartedly embraced. By the early years of the 20th century, the boys, as they became affectionately known, had achieved an international reputation in Europe and America. Davidson must have followed their progress with interest. He had at home's catalogues of exhibitions of their work in Munich in 1890 and Chicago in 1906, among others. Um, these catalogues are now in the Hunterian as part of the Davidson archive. Highlights included paintings by Edward Atkinson Hornell, George Henry, Harrington Mann, and Bessie McNichol that all add significantly to the story of the Glasgow boys and girls as seen through the, um, I've lost my page, as seen through the existing Hunter and Oldings. So on your screen, on the left, you can see a work by George Henry titled Three Girls in a Ro Cottage Rose Garden, and it's from 1891. It was possibly purchased from Alex Reed and Lefebvre in February 1928 with a title in the backyard. It is one of two works by Henry, both dated from the 1890s, to have come from the Davidson collection and now are now in the Hunterian. Together with his friend Hornell, um, and I quote, a contemporary critic who stated that they were animated by a vital and sincere delight in color and by a mastery of potent and intoxicating harmonies. Henry was considered in his days as among the most prominent of the Glasgow boys. Davidson owned three works by the artist at some point. In Three Girls in a Cottage Rose Garden, bold marks and blocks of colors define form and create a decorative surface pattern in which the evidence of the artist's manipulation of the paint surface is an important element. Painted in full sunlight, it represents the natural development of Henry's constant color and form. That transitory moment in the career of the Glasgow boys, when they were moving away from their earlier realist interest in issues of labor, leisure, and modern life towards a more symbolic decorative approach that obviously appealed to the Davidsons. 
It really adds to the Hunter interpretation of the artist's work, which previews to the Davidson sisters' bequest, counted eight works by the artist, including one of his most accomplished early rural realist painting, but did not cover the artist's 1980s experiments with a more symbolic. Get off my computer. The final painting for today is by Hornell, and you can see it on the right of your screen. And it's titled Autumn, dated 1896. Very close to Henry, the two artists often painted the same subjects together and occasionally collaborated on paintings in the 1890s. Hornell was a favorite with Davidson. <clears throat> At some point, the Davidson collection included 14 works by the artist, and William Davidson had in his office a copy of the 1936 cell of the collection of Sir Hugh Reed, a fellow enthusiastic patron of Hornell's, who by that time had 25 paintings by the artist. Three of Davidson's Hornells that used to hang in the Mac House drawing room and in his office are now in the Hunterian collection. What must have attracted Davidson to Hornell must have been that, as the Chicago Institute of Art Exhibition Catalog for 1908 puts it, and I quote, he did not and does not work from the standpoint of the conventional painter of pictures, but rather from that of the weaver of rugs, the designer of jeweled glass or mosaics. Beauty of color and its infinite combinations is a chief aim of his expression, end of quote. Davidson's paintings, now in the Hunterian, all date from the second half of the 1890s, when the artist, buoyed up by the success of his 1893, 1893 trip to Japan in the company of Henry, was trying to find a way forward from his Japanese subjects in inventive and innovative ways, playing with structure and paint application. Autumn, Picturing two girls in a wood is typical of that period. Young girls in woodland glades, possibly woodland spirits, associated with an allegory of the seasons were a popular subject matter among European painters, the Glasgow boys included, from the mid 1880s onwards. Hornell alone painted at least three paintings titled Autumn between 1888 and 1904, centered around such themes. <clears throat> The small painting Nine the Hunterian is contemporary with the artist's contribution to the Book of Autumn, which was published in 1896 and was the second issue of the Evergreen, a short-lived journal showcasing the Scottish Celtic revival movement, ideas, and aesthetics. With its textured brushwork and impenetrable surface, its figures emerging with autumnal woodland and naturalism is cute. It takes Hornell's fascination with an enclosed subject and fusion of figures and background initially explored in work from the late 1880s as far as it can go before reaching abstraction. Just like the Henry's, it fills an important gap in the Hunterian representation of Hornell that previously amounted to 11 works, mostly from the late 1880s and early 1990s or from the early 1900s. Now I hope that in the past 20 minutes or so, I've managed to make it clear that over the last hundred years, the gifts and bequests made by the Davidson family have played a crucial role in the development of the Hunterian representation of Scottish art. And I would like to finish by stressing one more time how the paintings and drawings gifted and bequeathed by Margaret and Winfred are a tangible reminder of William, Jean, and their family support, not just of Margaret and Charles Rene Macintosh, but also of several of their contemporaries that provide a glimpse not only into the achievements of early 20th century Scottish artists, but also into one of the most interesting collections gathered by a Glasgow collector in the early decades of the 20th century. Thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know and I can stop sharing the screen if I can. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anne, um, and for sharing such beautiful artworks with us. I do realise they are in our own collection, but it's just, it's even lovely to see them again just on the screen. Um, so thank you. As Anne said, if anyone has any questions, you're very welcome to pop them in the chat, or you, you're welcome to take yourself off mute um, if you would prefer. Silenced. <laughs> if we don't have any questions, Steve, then we can't. Oh, no, wait, we do. Oh, yes, I'll do that. Oh, yes, could links. you please, Anne? That would be great. Yeah. Right. Just I to need post to the links. Get out of the. Hang on. I'm going to small, make that smaller. 
and okay. And um, and we do have a question from Lola and Tui. Um, are there any photographs of the interior of the house showing the paintings, the paintings on the walls? No, this is what is really surprising. Um, there are photographs of the house. Um, and they were taken by um, Tiara Nan and Son, and they are um, most of the time um, taken for family occasions. Um, mm -hmm. And they are taken in the drawing room. And this inventory says that there were several works in the drawing room, but on the photographs, they don't appear. So I don't know whether they took them down for the photography so that it wouldn't be too busy or whether, uh, whether they weren't always hanging there. Um, I mean, the, the the idea that we have of where the pictures would have been is a valuation that was provided by Sotheby's at the death of William Davidson. So that's how it was at his death. I'm assuming that they were hanged during his lifetime as well. But I'm really keen to chat some more to Joseph, who is uh, Joseph Sharple, who is a curator for the Macintosh collection, because it's fascinating, this idea of having so many paintings hanging on the walls of the Mac house. And, and it might be fun to try and reconstruct it virtually just to get a feel for it. Uh, I think it'd be quite extraordinary. Very busy. Uh, I think I, I, we probably would prefer it as it is now, potentially. But he had a collection and he needed... I mean, the Davidsons had um, a house in Gladsmuir as well, where they could have had paintings hanging and we were also wondering whether he had some in his offices which I think were in Virginia Street in Glasgow but that inventory does say a lot of them were in the Mac house so uh, it does almost seem a wee bit at odds with how I see the Mac house because it's just so white and yeah clean and it's just you know it's it's just bright white like every room is um so no that would be wonderful to see it's um, the whole point of it isn't it it's not meant to I mean I can picture the Macintosh, well, Charles and Macintosh and Margaret McDonald's works working well in the rooms. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, some of the works, like the last two works that we saw by the Glasgow boys, Henry and uh, Hornell, they're very, yes, they just would clash, I think. But maybe not, who knows? We should try. We should. <laughs> and um, I think we've got a question from Lee. Lee's got her hand up. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, let me see. I'll do a wee ask to unmute. That might have been a mistake. <coughs> um, and we've got a question um, here and in the chat from Giovanna. What do you think the potential is for research on these collections? It's massive. I actually think there is a PhD there because I've just unearthed a tiny amount of the archival materials that is available. Um, so the archival material linked to the Davidson family is split in between the Hunterian and Glasgow University um, Archive and Special Collection Department. Um, and what is in Glasgow University Archive um, and Special Collection Department was acquired in 2019 and it's been roughly catalogued, but they're in the process of, um, you know, cataloging it properly. And this is where I found those receipts and, and letters um, about the commissioning of the portraits of William Davidson by Somerville Shanks. And there's plenty more, there's plenty more photographs as well. So I think there really is an opportunity there to get a good understanding of how the collection was formed. And um, we know that some of the works that were in um, William Davidson's collection were lent to exhibitions. Um, and there's probably a lot more work to be done around the dealers that he worked with, the auction houses that he worked with. Uh, his relationship with Ian McNichol is of interest. Um, and his involvement, involvement with the arts in general as well. There's also a lot of letters that uh, as I was, um, Tui was um, pointing out to me yesterday when she handed over the list of, you know, what was bought by whom and all of that to me, um, how the letters written by the family are very touching as well. You can feel a real warmth, uh, you know, in between the parents and the children, and they really kept in touch. And they went through a very difficult time. Um, William and Jean's eld uh, eldest son, I think, or younger son, I can't remember, but they had three sons and one of them died during World War One, for example. And so it, 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 there's also the, the life of a family there. So from a human point of view, it's really interesting. It happens at a very 
important moment of our history in the early decades of the 20th century from an art point of view. Um, if you're interested in Scottish art, this is Bonanza. Um, and then from, um, from a history of collections point of view, it's also incredibly interesting. So there are different angles that could be approached. Mm -hmm. um, 